Good morning and welcome as we gather to celebrate Mass on this 14th Sunday of our ordinary season. This weekend we also celebrate uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Sunday and the theme of this year is Heal the Country. And there's a little note in the uh, newsletter today of just some of the aspects of uh, that journey and how we might be able to be part of reconciliation and healing. We begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and we recognise their continuing connection to lands, waters and communities. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to our elders, past, present and emerging. And we sing our opening song. We remember how you loved us to your death and still we celebrate for you are with us here and we believe that we will see you when you come in your glory lord we remember we celebrate we believe here a million wounded souls are yearning just to touch you and to heal. Gather all your people and hold them in your heart. We remember how you loved us to your death. And still we celebrate, for you are with us here. And we believe that we will see you when you come. In your glory, Lord, we remember, we celebrate, we believe. In now we recreate your love. He bring the bread and wine to share our meal. Tell in grace and mercy, we'll praise of the Lord. We remember how you loved us to your death. And still we celebrate, for you are with us here. And we believe that we will see you when you come in your glory lord we remember we celebrate we believe in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit Amen. the peace of the lord be with you always as we gather we remember that we are a community gathered around the table of the lord and as we begin, I invite you to turn to someone near you, preferably someone you didn't come to Mass with this morning, and ask that person to be your prayer partner during our journey today. As we begin our Mass, let us now place ourselves in the presence of our loving and merciful God. Lord, you are Prince of Peace. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are Word made flesh and splendor of the Father. Christ, have mercy. Have mercy. Lord Jesus, you live in your church in word and in sacrament. Lord have, Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us all our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord, God, heavenly King, O God, almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. 
you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who in the abasement of your Son have raised up a fallen world, fill your faithful with holy joy for, the, on, for those you have rescued from slavery to sin. You bestow eternal gladness. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. From the prophet Ezekiel. The Spirit came into me and made me stand up, and I heard the Lord speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to the rebels who have turned against me. Till now they have their ancestors have been driven against me. The sons of the defiant and obstinate, I am sending you to them to say, The Lord says this, whether they listen or or not, this set of rebels shall know there is a prophet among them. The word of the Lord. Our eyes are fixed on the Lord, pleading for his mercy. To you have I lifted up my eyes. You who dwell in the heavens, mine eyes like the eyes of slaves on the hand of their lords. Our eyes are fixed on the Lord, pleading for his mercy, like the eyes of a servant on the hand of his mistress. So our eyes are on the Lord our God till he show us his mercy. Our eyes are fixed on the Lord, pleading for his mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy. We are filled with contempt. Indeed, all too full is our soul with the scorn of the rich, with the proud man's disdain. Our eyes are fixed on the Lord. The letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. In view of the extraordinary nature of these revelations to stop me from getting too proud, I was given a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan to beat me and stop me from getting too proud. About this thing, I have pleaded with the Lord three times for it to leave me, but he said, my grace is enough for you. My power is at its best in weakness, so I shall be very happy to make my weakness my special boast, so that the power of Christ may stay over me. And that is why I am quite content with my weaknesses. And with insults, hardships, persecution, and the agonies of the, I go through for Christ's sake, for it is when I am weak that I am strong. The word of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He sent me to bring good news to the poor. The Lord be with you. And with From the Gospel according to Mark. Glory Jesus came, went to his hometown and his disciples accompanied him. With the coming of the Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and most of them were astonished when they heard him. They said, 
where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been granted him and these miracles that are worked through him? This is the carpenter, surely, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Jude and Simon. His sisters too, are they not here with us? And they would not accept him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is only despised in his own country, among his own relations, and in his own house. And he would work no miracle there, though he cured a few sick people by laying his hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. This is the fourth week of the message series that we've called New Ways of God. Over these weeks we've been listening to the early sections of Mark's Gospel and we've been introduced to this good news that Jesus has come to proclaim and to be aware that it was written at a time when the people of Jerusalem had been excluded from the synagogue they were no longer able to worship with the, in the temple and the people who were living in Rome were people who were being persecuted because they were followers of the way. And so Mark's Gospel principally sets out to give people courage and encouragement in this time and to say to them that even though everything around them wasn't working, God had a plan and the plan wasn't just a story, it was a person. And so they were being introduced to the introduced to the person of Jesus in a new and different way. And we've seen over these four weeks so far, at least the first three weeks, the story of how faith is an integral part in that story. The story of the seed that gets sown and grows during the night. Mark tells us that the planter, the sower, doesn't know how it happens, but it does happen. Something powerfully works in the soil, in the seed, and eventually there is fruit that is born from it. And the kind of concern that God has for his people is the concern that says that even a weed can grow up to provide shelter for the birds of the air, that they can find comfort under something which is God's plan for us. And then we had that remarkable story of the calming of the sea. In the Old Testament, the notion of chaos was something quite um, a part of their story. And the real power of God or even any of the new Middle East uh, um, deities, was their control over the chaos, the creation of peace. And in a very real way, we see Jesus do that. There's a beautiful line in it, and and Deacon Mick mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, the story of how when the disciples were anxious, they turned to Jesus and said, Lord, aren't you upset or aren't you worried that we might drown? And Jesus looks at them and says have you no faith? Um, Deacon Mick mentioned it and I mentioned it last week. They did have faith. They went to Jesus. Um, If you want to find an answer when you're in trouble, the place to turn to is to the Lord. And so they did. And yet Jesus uh, not so much condemned them but admonished them for not having enough faith. Um, Since that's what Jesus said, I'm going to accept that. But I believe that they did have faith because they knew where to go to when they needed to. But last weekend we had another beautiful experience of what faith is about, and that was the story of the two women. One, a woman just about to begin her life, and the other, a woman who, because of her hemorrhaging, had been excluded from the community. In both cases, there was an incredible amount of faith. Jairus knew that if Jesus came, his daughter would be cured, and the woman knew that if she simply reached out and touched his cloak, she would be healed. And the power that went out from Jesus so captured him that he looked around and said, who touched me? And the woman came forward and said, I did, even though it would mean the possibility of being condemned by the crowd. And Jesus says to her, daughter, your faith has saved you. Giving her an acknowledgement that's not mentioned anywhere else in the scriptures and so has created a relationship with her which is so different from any other relationship that Jesus has. Daughter, 
the gift that he gives to her is something quite profound because this woman excluded from the community is now embraced into a family and she is made to feel whole. So I mentioned last week and it comes through in the readings today is the sense that sometimes exclusion isn't the fact of actively turning somebody aside but it can also be and probably more hurtful is when the people with whom we live and work don't include us. They don't actually positively exclude, they just don't reach out to include. And it picks up that um, thing that is frequently used, the opposite of love isn't hate, it's apathy, it's the lack of love. And that reminds us that, you know, when we want to reach out to people, it's not just to make them aware or us aware that they're there, but what do we actually do to welcome them into our community and to make them part of our community? That's part of the reason why we do the acknowledgement of country at Mass each Sunday. It's to recognise that we have for a long time not excluded necessarily, but not really been inclusive. And the need to be inclusive is a real challenge to us. And that's something that we need to continually reflect on and continually journey with. And so we come to today's readings. At each of the three readings today, something very powerful is being spoken of. The prophet Ezekiel is telling us that uh, he is sent to tell a message to the people that they don't want to hear. And the Lord says to Ezekiel, Son of man, I'm sending you to the Israelites, to the rebels who have turned against me. And the reason he had to do that was because we know down through the history of the Old Testament, the people time and time again turned aside from the Lord. They would be comfortable with following God at different stages, but then something would happen. Another ruler would come along or another people would come into their midst and suddenly instead of being open to what God's covenant was, they would follow the ways of the world, the ways of the people around them. And so the prophet, the role of the prophet isn't so much to tell people they're doing something wrong, but rather to stand before them as a word about what was right, to say the uncomfortable thing, to talk about the power of God, the presence of God and God's love for us at a time when sometimes that language is uncomfortable. And so to be a prophet is always going to be a challenge. It's going to be an invitation to something different. And we'll see that in weeks to come of how the, the prophets are always being called to be words whose uh, word that is spoken into an uncomfortable silence but at the end of that reading um, Ezekiel makes this comment he says whether they listen or not this set of rebels will know that there is a prophet among them because God's plan is never to leave us alone or lost it's always that we might know how to find the way to the Father, how to find the way that brings us to life. And sometimes, as I said, that's going to be an uncomfortable kind of journey because it's not going to be necessarily words of consolation or comfort. Sometimes it will have to be challenging words. And we know that uh, as we listen to Paul, there is that challenging word that he gives to us as well. And that's the fact that, like Paul, most of us have a thorn in the flesh. Most of us have some area in our life that is an area of our frailty and our sinfulness. It may not be something great, it may just something be like the little pebble in our shoe, that it's okay for a while, but after a time it becomes completely uncomfortable and causes us anguish. But we all have that brokenness. That's why Jesus came to save us, because he knew that our humanness was something that would ultimately allow us to fail and to sin. As I said, not necessarily greatly, not necessarily too much of a challenge, but it's that challenge that says, what are we about? At the moment, I'm reading a book and uh, sharing with um, some friends overseas at the moment. I haven't got copies of the book to start a book club here, which I hope to do. But it's a book called Living the Fruits of the Spirit. And one of the questions in this book asks the simple question, 
Which of the fruits of the Spirit do you have difficulty with? Patience, kindness, love, and all of those. The one that I have difficulty with, and this is not confession, but it's just an admission of my thing, is not patience or whatever, it's self-control. Just look at me. <laughs> it's that awareness that something in me doesn't have the self-discipline to say no to all of the things in my life. It's my thorn in the flesh that I struggle with self-control. Paul doesn't tell us what his problem is, so I'm one step ahead of Paul, but that's about as far as I'm going to go. But it's that sense of saying, how do we actually recognise what is our brokenness, our thorn in the flesh? Paul actually acknowledges that the Lord says to him that uh, my grace is enough for you. My power is at best in your weakness. Thank you, God, but I don't want to look like thee. What's that? Um, oh yeah, there was a name for the not the blimp, uh, but that tire man. Michelin man, thank you. I don't want to be the Michelin man. So how do we begin to take that step a little bit further? How do we begin to be aware of what it is that God is asking for us in our weakness? The words at the end of the passage is very beautiful because it says that he is able to finally admit, for it is when I am weak that I am strong. Because when I am weak, it's when I'm most able to allow God to come into my life. And that is a huge step of faith. That's a huge awareness that as I grow into that, then my understanding of God's love for me becomes that much more uh, an awareness for my whole life. Today, however, as we come to the gospel, we see something more profound begin to happen in our lives. Jesus returns to Nazareth. And in Mark's gospel, this is the first time he comes to Nazareth. He begins to speak and the people are amazed at what he says because there is a wisdom and a depth that hasn't been present in their normal teaching situation. But then suddenly they start to ask a question. How did he get all this? We know who he is. He lived here. We saw him as a kid. We saw what he did. We make all these presumptions because automatically they begin to say, we know who you are, so why are you trying to tell us something different about God and God's love for us? We don't trust you. We know that they then sought to get rid of him. But Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. And yet it's real. How often do we, and this is what comes back to this question, do we actually include people rather than exclude them? Do we really let people belong because we know where they came from? I can remember many years ago there were some reunions of classes for students at St Virgil's and um, I was with a particular eight class group, I think it was the 68, 69 and 70, so there was three years. And there was one fellow who had actually left at the end of grade 10 and so had gone to the mainland, hadn't been back to Tasmania and was there at, uh, at this reunion for some reason. And uh, I wasn't... Um, wearing a collar or crosses or anything. I was there in casual clothes as everybody else was there. And um, he said, uh, going around and somebody said, do you know what, uh, what Mike does? He's either a lawyer or he's in jail. <laughs> and I said, what made you say that? He said, well, I, w I knew you at school. <laughs> now, I don't know what I did at school that gave that impression. <laughs> But he put me in a box. He would thought that because he knew something about me from school, that that's what it would be. So when I told him I was a priest, he said, yep, you've probably been in jail then. <laughs> that wasn't the intention. 
he didn't actually say that. It was a rather sick comment of mine. But the, the notion is that we do actually put people in boxes. We do make judgments about them without beginning to think about or understand the message. And even though Jesus found no faith amongst the people there, he was still able to cure some people by laying hands on them and healing them. The faith that Jesus needed to find there wasn't there. But his sense of care and his sense of concern for the people was still very real. And so he really did reach out to them and to heal them. And so instead of having an abundance of faith, today we're hearing that faith can be excluded from our lives when we choose to make decisions about people that doesn't respect them and doesn't value them. When we make decisions that prevent people from being able to live and love as God calls us to live, then they too are excluded. So the challenge for us as being, being people of faith is not to do it on my terms, not to make decisions about my reflection on people, but rather about how does God bless them and love them. The passage I frequently use at the end of my homilies comes from chapter 5 of Matthew's Gospel and it says to live generously and graciously towards others as God has lived towards us is so powerfully present in this story today that when we don't value the other, then we can't really respect and love God as God loves us. So my prayer is that we will be open to the gift of each person, that we'll be open to the graces and the gifts that God gives them and gives to us through them, that we might then be available and open to then reach out to others and to make a difference in our world. Together let us make our profession of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was confined, died, and was buried. He reigned it into hell. On the third day he rose again in the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. My friends, we lift up our eyes and our hearts to the Lord to make intercession for the needs of our world, our church, and for ourselves. For the prophets of our day, that they will continue to speak the word of truth in the face of opposition. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For families divided by misunderstandings and separation, May they find ways to discover acceptance and forgiveness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the staff and students in our schools, that the holiday period will be both safe and refreshing for all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the children preparing for the sacrament of confirmation, May they grow closer to God as they continue their journey. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our parish community, that we will always be open to receive 
and embrace the challenging words of Jesus. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick, that Christ will bring their new life, including those mentioned in our newsletter, and all for whom our prayers have been asked. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have gone before us in faith, especially Gwen Doyle, Vicky Rowlands, and Molly Anning, who have died recently, and all those whose anniversaries we remember. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our own special intentions, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our prayer partner, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We join together as we say the plenary council prayer. Come, Holy Spirit of Pentecost, come, Holy Spirit of the Great Southland. O God, unite and unite all your people in Australia and guide us on the pilgrim way of the plenary council. Give us the grace to see your face in one another and to recognize Jesus, our companion on the road. Give us the courage to tell our stories and to speak boldly of your truth. Give us ears to listen humbly to each other and a discerning heart to hear what you are saying. Lead your church into a hope-filled future that we may live the joy of the gospel. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, bread for the journey from age to age. Amen. Lady, help of Christians, pray for us. St. Mary MacKillop, pray for us. to offer. Come, listen, live. Pray, my friends, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May your hand for the praise and glory of his name, for our good, the good of all his holy church. May this oblation dedicated to your name purify us, O Lord, and day by day bring our conduct closer to the life of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Your hearts and let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Lord it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. 
For in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit, through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. And so with all the angels we praise you, as in joyful celebration we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis our Pope, Julian our Bishop and all those who are called to your service. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face and have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the apostles, St. Aloysius, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours for ever and ever. Amen. And now, my friends, at the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, 
who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer those nearest a sign of that peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of all the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
let us pray. Grant, we pray, O Lord, that having been replenished by these such great gifts, we may gain the prize of salvation and never cease to praise you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Just a, another word of thanks to, to Michael who has managed to paint the foyer now. So he tells me that he only has the skirting boards to do and it's going to take him no time at all. Anyone who's painted skirting boards knows that that's a fib. But anyway, so thank you, Michael, for all that effort. Reminder that morning tea is available after Mass this morning, so please, you're most welcome to stay and uh, enjoy some hospitality. And if you can't, then please go with our grace and blessing. The Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Mass is ended. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Sing to the mountains, sing to the sea. Raise your voices, lift your hearts. This is the day the Lord has made. Let all the earth rejoice. I will give thanks to you, O Lord. You have answered my plea. You have saved my soul from death. You are my strength and my song. Sing to the mountains, sing to the sea.